and so the rivers many and great, and good streams, the most of which bear gold. If it sounded like paradise, well, that was no accident. Paradise filled with gold. And when he came to describe the people he had met, Columbus's Edenic imagery never faltered. The people of this island, and of all the other islands which I have found and seen, or have not seen, all go naked, men and women, as their mothers bore them, except that some women cover one place only with the leaf of a plant, or with a net of cotton which they make for that purpose. They have no iron or steel or weapons, nor are they capable of using them, although they are well-built people of handsome stature, because they are wondrous timid. They are so artless and free with all they possess that no one would believe it without having seen it. Of anything they have, if you ask them for it, they never say no. Rather, they invite the person to share it, and show as much love as if they were giving their hearts. And whether the thing be of value or of small price, at once they are content with whatever little thing of whatever kind may be given to them. For years to come, Columbus repeatedly would insist that his expeditions and adventures in the New World had nothing to do with mere reason, mathematics, and maps, as two scholars of the subject put it, but rather that his execution of the affair of the Indies was a fulfillment of prophecies in Isaiah. In addition to helping explain, if taken seriously, why Columbus in many respects was a less successful navigator and helmsman that is commonly supposed, once into the Caribbean he rarely seemed to know where he was, and routinely lost ships that were under his command. This rhetorical claim of biblical guidance is a clue to understanding the European reaction to his reported find. Columbus finished his letter, describing what he had seen on his voyage, on March 4th of 1493. A printed version of it was published in Barcelona, and was widely circulated less than a month later. A month after that, a translated edition was circulating in Rome. A month after that, a version that set the letter to verse appeared. Others followed in Antwerp, Basel, Paris, Florence, Strasbourg, Valladolid, and elsewhere most of them going back for second and third and fourth printings. At least seventeen different translated editions appear throughout Europe within five years following Columbus's return from that first voyage. If not the biblical Eden or the fabled fortunate isles of classical myth, Columbus, it seemed, at least had found some sort of paradise on earth. Such places had long filled the legends and dreams of all the peoples of Europe, as they would on into the future. It was no coincidence that during the next two centuries the invented utopias of Bacon and Moore and Harrington and others invariably would be located in distant oceanic lands to the west. But myths of paradise and utopia were complex and often confused affairs. On the one hand, in some versions, they represented a rediscovered time of innocent perfection dating from before the biblical fall from grace. On the other hand, some dreams of such perfection envisioned and were built upon the expectation of a future time of anticipated peace and harmony. And bound up with every myth, past, present, or future, was still another and contradictory vision of the primordial world, a satanic vision of savagery and wildness and the dark. Before long, reports were circulating that Satan himself resided on one of those islands in the Caribbean Sea. Perhaps it was only natural, then, as Lewis Hankey has said, that the popular image in the first feverish months of a terrestrial paradise was soon succeeded by that of a hostile continent peopled with armed warriors rushing out of the tropical forests or strange cities to resist the advance of the Spanish soldiers and the missionary efforts of their companion friars. It was only a matter of time before that stereotype of barbarically hostile natives had metamorphosed once again. As best described by its most famous proponent, the eminent Spanish scholar Juan Ginés de Sepúlveda, the next representation of the New World's Indians was as creatures of a subhuman Caliban-like nature, who were intended by God to be placed under the authority of civilized and virtuous princes or nations, so that they may learn from the might, wisdom, and law of their conquerors to practice better morals, worthier customs, and a more civilized way of life that the visions of the ferocious Indian assailant or the inferior natural slave were fictions, 
as much as the image of a prelapsarian American Eden had been, mattered not one bit to anyone. The myths were simply formed and reformed, shaped and reshaped, and made to do whatever work their propagators at any given moment wanted done. Numerous modern scholars have dissected and analyzed the effects of both biblical and classical myth on the minds of Europeans during this so-called age of discovery. But at least as strong as all the mixed-up imaginings of terrestrial heavens and Elysian fields, of lusty maidens and cannibalistic human beasts, was a fervent, and in many cases a truly maniacal, European craving for raw power and the wealth of gold and silver. Among the clergy, meanwhile, there was the promise of God's favor should they successfully introduce the New World's pagan innocence to the glory of His grace. It is not surprising, then, that in the very first sentence of his celebrated letter to the Spanish crown, Columbus says of the lands that he has found, And of them have I taken possession for their highnesses, by proclamation and with the royal standard displayed, and nobody objected. Consider the picture. Standing alone with a few of his fellow officers in the white coral sand of a tiny island, whose identification remains disputed to this day, an island discovered by Columbus, despite the fact that it was well populated, and had in fact been discovered by others thousands of years earlier, the admiral took possession of it, and of all the people it contained, and nobody objected. Clearly God was on the Spaniard's side. So it went from island to island, small and large, throughout the Caribbean. Wherever he went, Columbus planted a cross, making, as he said, the declarations that are required, and claiming ownership of the land for his royal patrons back in Spain. Despite the fact that Columbus noted in his own journal of the voyage that the people of these lands do not understand me, nor I them, it seems to have been of particular satisfaction to him that never once did any of the onlooking Arawak-speaking islanders object to his repeated proclamations in Spanish that he was taking control of their lands away from them. Ludicrous though this scene may appear to us in retrospect, at the time it was a deadly serious ritual, similar in ways equally ludicrous and deadly to the other famous ritual the Spanish bestowed upon the non-Spanish-speaking people of the Americas, the requerimiento. Following Columbus, each time the Spanish encountered a native individual or group in the course of their travels, they were ordered to read to the Indians a statement informing them of the truth of Christianity and the necessity to swear immediate allegiance to the Pope and to the Spanish crown. After this, if the Indians refused or even delayed in their acceptance, or more likely their understanding, of the requerimiento, the statement continued, I certify to you that, with the help of God, we shall powerfully enter into your country, and shall make war against you in all ways and manners that we can, and shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the Church and of their highnesses, we shall take you and your wives and your children, and shall make slaves of them, and as such shall sell and dispose of them as their highnesses may command, and we shall take your goods, and shall do you all the mischief and damage that we can, as to vassals who do not obey, and refuse to receive their lord, and resist and contradict him. In practice, the Spanish usually did not wait for the Indians to reply to their demands. First, the Indians were manacled, then, as it were, they were read their rights. As one Spanish conquistador and historian described the routine, after they had been put in chains, someone read the recarimiento without knowing their language and without any interpreters, and without either the reader or the Indians understanding the language, they had no opportunity to reply, being immediately carried away prisoners, the Spanish not failing to use the stick on those who did not go fast enough. In this perverse way, the invasion and destruction of what many, including Columbus, had thought was a heaven on earth began. Not that a reading of the requerimiento was necessary to the inhuman violence the Spanish were to perpetrate against the native peoples they confronted. Rather, the proclamation was merely a legalistic rationale for a fanatically religious and fanatically juridical and fanatically brutal people to justify a holocaust. After all, Columbus had seized and kidnapped Indian men, women, and children throughout his first voyage, long before the requerimiento was in use, five at one stop, six at another, more at others, 
filling his ships with varied samples of Indians to display like exotic beasts in Seville and Barcelona upon his return. On at least one occasion, Columbus sent a raiding party ashore to capture some women with their children to keep his growing excess of captured native males company, because, he wrote in his journal, his past experience in abducting African slaves had taught him that the Indian men would behave better in Spain with women of their country than without them. On this date he also records the vignette of the husband of one of these women and father of three children, a boy and two girls, who followed his captured family onto Columbus's ship and said that if they had to go, he wished to come with them and begged me hard, and they all now remain consoled with him. But not for long, as a harbinger of things to come, only a half dozen or so of those many captured native slaves survived the journey to Spain, and of them only two were alive six months later. On his second voyage, Columbus tried an even more ambitious kidnapping and enslavement scheme. It is described by an Italian nobleman, Michele de Cugno, who accompanied Columbus on this voyage. When our caravels in which I wished to go home had to leave for Spain, we gathered together in our settlement sixteen hundred people, male and female, of those Indians, of whom, among the best males and females, we embarked on our caravels on 17th February, 1495, five hundred and fifty souls. Of the rest who were left, the announcement went around that whoever wanted them could take as many as he pleased, and this was done. And when everybody had been supplied, there were some four hundred of them left, to whom permission was granted to go wherever they wanted. Among them were many women who had infants at the breast. They, in order the better to escape us, since they were afraid we would turn to catch them again, left their infants anywhere on the ground, and started to flee like desperate people. No one knows what happened to those six hundred or so leftover natives who were enslaved on the admiral's order by whoever wanted them, or the four hundred or so who fled in terror, or their abandoned infants. But by the time Columbus's ships entered the waters outside Spain, of the 550 captured Indians he took with him, 200 had died. Says Cunio, we cast them into the sea. When they reached Cadiz, half of the remaining 350 slaves were sick and dying. Only a relative few survived much longer because, Cunio surmised, they are not working people, and they very much fear cold, nor have they long life. This final point, nor have they long life, would not have been true a few years earlier. The health and life expectancy of the natives had been far superior to that of the Europeans prior to the Colombian invasion. But by the time Cunio was writing, he was certainly correct. Once the first Spanish settlements had taken root, the hold on life that any Indian had at any given moment was tenuous at best. Spanish diseases had begun their own invasion of the Americas almost from the moment Columbus and his crews first breathed upon their New World hosts. But the systematic, genocidal destruction of the Indians did not begin until Columbus's return. 2. 